It's my pleasure to introduce you to two wonderful artists. Uh, Paula Crown is going to be in conversation with Edmund Duvall, and Edmund has been an incredible artist in residence for us this summer at the Aspen Institute. He came for a week at Ideas Festival. He's back. Really wanted to address you all here, um, and I'm going to turn it right over to them to get into discussions about the Bauhaus. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. Thank it is so wonderful to be with everyone to celebrate uh, this 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus, as we know, is a way of thinking, collaborating, and crossing thresholds of disciplines. Its ethos and sense of possibility continues to resonate and teach us ways of being in the world. Edmund and I have been fortunate to have numerous conversations over the years, but I think some of the most focused and compelling have been about understanding the, the Bauhaus and it, its way of, of operating and, and being and, and what we could take from it. And today we're going to be talking about mark making and what better way to start than with a poster by Her Herbert Beyer who shows the, uh, the indexical marks that we make every day and appreciating those marks. I would like, just at that moment, Paula, to say, A, how thrilled I am, but also I've never skied in my life. And so seeing that wonderful Herbert Beyer image of us both skiing down the Aspen Mountain makes me, makes me feel extraordinary, because, of course, I've never, ever touched snow. So anyway, that's just, that's just something we might not get to in this conversation. Well, so anyway. That, that's another conversation yeah, that's another we can conversation. have. Yeah. <laughs> On we go. So, Edmund, we talk a lot about looking. What are you looking at? What are you looking for? Um, this, is, this, is, this is me trying to be uh, in active French existentialist uh, mode um, in my black hoodie with my, my, my tennis shoes on. Um, this is me actually in my studio. So this is what happens a lot in my studio, which is making stuff. And I have a special space in the studio um, where I put one work one work at a time. And it's a kind of, it's a really, it's a really interesting space for me because it, there's huge amounts of light pouring into this particular part of the studio. And, and this, is, this is me trying to work out what I've done um, and looking, I'd say, pretty grim in the process of, of, of doing so. Um, so. But go on, yes, so, so, so that brings up the question uh, of our studios and how is your studio designed to enable the possibility of, of focus and looking deeply. It's actually a perfect start, actually, to think about studios in, in the context of the Bauhaus. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a really, really tremendously generative place to start. So, so studios, well, well, my studio is um, a, 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 an old gun factory in an incredibly um, unglamorous part of, of, of South London. Um, all the windows in my studio are opaque, so I don't look out onto the West Norwood bus garage, which is what is my neighbour, and lots of traffic. Um, it's a series of spaces um, that have been carved out for making, or for, for, for making and for writing and for looking, and so this particular space is where I look at one work, and the reason I wanted to show you this one. Uh, Paulo, this is a piece called Bauspiel. It's actually, it's actually, it was created actually thinking about the Bauhaus. Um, it's a series of opaque vitrines, um, and we might come back to vitrines later in the conversation. Very we're allowed to, which sort of, uh, you, which are animated and, and light comes through in different ways. And then, in a different part of the studio, there's a staircase going up, um, and it goes up to to to, to where I make. Pots. And it's a very sort of monastic space. It's a very simple, simple space. It's, it's, it's tiny. I mean, it really is it's, it's no space at all. It's just a, a place where I have my potter's wheel. I have an incredibly uncomfortable um, bench, which I sit on, which I've had now for 40 years, um, which I hunch over on, a water, clay, my dog. Um, and that's one space. Mm -hmm. And then the other staircase takes me up to this space, which is about books, 
and objects um, and fragments. You can see lots of, 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 of um, a, a shelf of, of, of broken things here, broken white porcelain objects I've picked up on my travels in China when I was trying to write a book, uh, Malevich's white teapot. Um, it's quite a cool thing to have. Um, and a first piece of mice and porcelain. Uh, uh, and so books and fragments and shards all sort of shuffled up together. Um, uh, but this is more natural uh, state of my being. It's it, it, where, where I'm desperately looking. I took this picture because I was, I was, I was trying to find a, a book of poems. And um, by the time I'd taken 72 books off the shelves, I still hadn't found it. But it's my Donald Judd chair which I sit on in a slightly penitent way. It's very, very uncomfortable. An Agnes Martin drawing and books. And so my studio is, is clay in one place, uh, uh, books, shards in another, and then lots of writing on the walls. So the whole space is also is me trying desperately to kind of run between different kinds of mark making. So that's, 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 that's me in South London. And, and do they inform one another, uh, the books and the writing and um, the pots and the place of making? The place of making, there are no doors in the studio. So actually, it's not true. The kiln room, which is f full of kilns and, and dangerous oxides and minerals, and we have extraordinarily good ventilation systems there because that's full of, of danger. It's an alchemist's studio. But otherwise, there are no doors. And so I flow through from, from making to note-taking to scribbling to, to all these different things come and go. It's a sort of breathing in and breathing out of different kinds of parts of my practice. So that, but, but the, stu the studios matter. Mm -hmm. the studios matter. So what I love about this, this is a, an analog uh, online search engine uh, <laughs> happening here, right? Yes, um, yes it is. It's, Yes. And, and I find when um, I'm looking for something as well in my library, I get wonderfully distracted, just like I do online. But there's something much more connective about the book itself and holding it. Yes. In fact, I sort of want to talk you through all those books, but, but perhaps not in public <laughs> here. So th this is my studio and, and just a beautiful triad um, of people. And the third one is, is Frank Gehry uh, and his work behind me at Pritzker Pavilion. Um, the woman on the, on the right is Jeannie Gang, who interviewed Frank at the Aspen Institute uh, on Saturday night. So I was very fortunate to have Jeannie build this studio. And we agreed on certain things about having a library in the center and about having a healthy space and then connecting it out into the world. So I show you this because I'm delusional about what I hope my studio, my office will look like. Um, this is not what it looks like, um, but the core um, provides me beautiful spaces to write research, uh, to meditate. Everything in the studio is either um, reclaimed, reused, low VOC off-gassing. The floor was going to be turned into chip. It was from a local park, uh, Grant Park, that we reclaimed and made into flooring. Jeannie and I designed this desk as pods and, and efficient ways of um, uh, connecting. As Edmund was saying, we work with toxic materials. And it was really important to me to have a healthy and healthful space. And so we have these evacuation hoods throughout. Uh, most people don't talk about um, the hazards, but it's important for my teammates, people visit, and, and certainly um, for myself. And the centerpiece, the library, which is right in the center of it all, where I'm always pulling books out yeah. and bringing them into the studio or reading during lunch. And uh, let, let's talk about our 
books and our collections and how that contributes to our practices. Yeah, so I mean, I, I love, I, first of all, I actually love the idea of a library being the center of everything. I mean, it seems, it seems to me that's a kind of, it's such a, it's such a, a beautiful image for, for what a studio should be, mm -hmm. that it's a, it's, it's a place where actually you are absolutely in conversation with this extraordinary array of, 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 of people and texts and, and different voices. So it's the kind of multivocal nature of a, a library. Which, mm -hmm. which is so extraordinary. So having that at the centre, it seems to me fantastic. It's also massively distracting, and I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of intrigued by because we're going to be talking in a second about about you use this. I'd never heard this phrase before, but you used a fantastic. Thing. We, we were talking the other day about the pra your, about practice being multi hyphenate. Mm -hmm. I.e., you know, it's endlessly crossing boundaries or acknowledging boundaries but crossing them, mm -hmm. which I really like. So multi-hyphenate. And of course, a library is a multi-hyphenate space. It's a mm -hmm. space where all kinds of possibilities happen. So this is the middle of your studio. You've got mm -hmm. spaces where you have to vent out complicated, dangerous chemicals. You've got presumably a space where you have finished work. You've got mark making happening in different kinds of ways. I mean. Talk me from here, talk, I haven't seen the space. Talk me through from here, where, where do you go next? So the, the studio for me is creating an environment that's conducive. And I didn't think about the doors. I do have doors that close, mm. but there you're allowed is- to have do You're allowed to have doors. Doors. You know, it's, it's, it's allowed. <laughs> but, but the fluidity yeah. is really important and the, and the conversation among mm. all of these ideas and you know, information um, is always information, and and how we develop and how we build this palimpsest of knowledge, and then how we can ex excavate back mm -hmm. and and learn from the past and also uh, apply them with new technologies. So let's talk a little bit about what we do in our studios. Yeah. yeah. So um, my first step in, in understanding um, the world is through the eye and the hand, uh, that this connection of the hand, eye, and heart, and the transference of the energy from, from the hand to the paintbrush or the object is really the focus of, of my work. Um, you know, vision is, is corporal, and, and the body is, is the eye. Uh, it may uh, translate a 40,000-year-old cave sign of a spiral into a 3D activated image. It may um, be a place where things are revealed. Uh, it, w with regard to this, I've been buying homeless signs, and I've been scanning them at high resolution and blowing them up, uh, putting them on silk. And, and what is, is revealed by the, by the marks um, and, and the communication uh, that the homeless are, are not invisible, they're, they're part of our community. Words are so important. I've done an extensive series uh, using the phonetic alphabet of Alpha Bravo. Mm. Uh, so we can think about more clearly how we can, can communicate. So all these are different kinds of, different kinds of language. These are mm -hmm. different kinds of mark making, different kinds of uh, the, the sign in its real sense of, of, of you understanding how your hand can understand other kinds of mark making in the world. Uh, it, exactly. Uh, and and my, um, my recent work, these Aspen maps, are uh, layers of maps that I've rotated mm. and compressed and looking for what else can be learned or revealed. I love this image. Testing one, two, three with yeah. silver and um, impressions and um, a very rigorous color palette. Actually, that last image spoke so entirely to, to, to the, the last extraordinary series. There are lots of people nodding in, ar around us because there's been these wonderful images we've had of, of all morning of people at the Bauhaus bringing materials together to try and find the kind of energy levels, the synapses, the kind, of, the kind of flow of energy between different kinds of materiality. Just to kind of, to look at that and to feel it 
you know, somatically and then discover. So that's, that's Albers would be proud of this photograph. <laughs> you know, it, kind of, it kind of works. But, but also, to my studio it is a lab. Yeah. And we put things together, and there are plenty of things that don't work, and failure's data. You have to make a lot and fail a lot to find the things that work. And uh, the cups we'll talk about a little bit further, but they are about the transference of energy and appreciating each mark that we make in the world. And as soon as I see that, I just, sorry, I just, you know, you can't see that series of cups without actually having your hand actually move. You know, you actually want to, we haven't got anything to, we haven't got anything to break here. Well, we've only got glass, but yes, absolutely. Yeah. So everything's possible. And again, uh, being resonant of the Bauhaus, um, I'm painting on the surface of water. And then how that can become a, a cosmic uh, landscape or topology. Mark making. I mean, my own practice um, um, with clay. I mean, again, going back to the Bauhaus, back, back, back to the Bauhaus. This thing about, about um, about discipline, um, about, about, about learning a particular discipline amongst many. Uh, I, I was told when I was apprenticed as a potter that the first 30,000 pots you make are the worst. You know, and it's a kind of Bauhausian sort of statement, a polemical statement, which I kind of, I, I, I kind of understand. So when I sit at my wheel, um, with porcelain, this beautiful white seductive porcelain, what am I doing? I'm, well, apart from listening to the radio, I'm, what I'm doing is, is, is an iterative process. It's, it's taking one ball of clay, centering it on the wheel, making a cylinder, uh, breathing in, breathing out, doing it again. And of course, that iterative process, that coming and going of the hand and the mind, um, has a very beautiful and extraordinary rhythm over the years. I mean, it's, it's, it's mark making in, the, in, in a moment, but it's actually mark making somatically, bodily, over decades. I mean, I've been doing this forever. I'm very, very old. I mean, I've been doing this for, for almost 50 years, since I was five. So, um, so, so, so this, this, is, this is my mark making. This is, you know, I, I am, this is it. You can also see the coffee. Actually, that's the mm. most important wow, image of the whole. The whole. The whole of the, of the thing is is very dark coffee. Too much of it. Um, so, 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 mark making in this way is is the beginning. Is 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 my er uh, experience. My 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 genesis. And and is this something? What 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 does your day in the studio look like? Is this your priority and the thing that you go I, if, to first? If I had a normal day in the studio, I would be blessed beyond anything. I, I, I don't. But when I do have time, it's so precious. What I do is go into the studio as early as possible mm -hmm. uh, before any of the rest of the team get there. And, and, and it's basically, it's coffee, it's the Goldberg variations, and it's clay, you know, and that's pretty good. So, and um, what I'm doing here is thinking my way into an installation. So I'm, I'm putting together, I'm putting together the world. I'm, I'm making bits of, I'm making vessels, or my vessels are, are spaces, their volumes, their breath. We've mm -hmm. talked about this over the weeks. Um, um, and so it's one breath, I'm putting down one breath after another. So I've heard that Pablo Casals played the same Bach piano piece every day for 85 years, and he was asked if he found that to be boring. And he said, no, it's I, something else is re revealed or discovered every time I go through this process. Well, I, 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 I'm not bored yet, you know, I'm not bored yet. Uh, you, you know, it's, but but it's, it's, it's this, but it, it changes. I mean, and, and this is what we'll talk about, because I've also been writing, you know, I, 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 you can probably just discern some beautiful lyrical title written on the wall behind me. You, probably in German. I'm always, my children who are here are always la laughing at me my, about my titles. But what I've started to do is also to, to write into porcelain. And this is the last six months. I I'm, this is me being public about this. So I haven't shown these works yet. But this is me writing texts 
um, it, it, writing texts which are then transferred into plaster and then turned into porcelain. And these are fragments, um, and they're broken up and fired and, and in fact, gilded as well. Um, so this is clay happening in a different way, and, where the, uh, and this is what happens. This, this, I made this piece on, on, on Thursday in London. It's a, it's a fragment of writing by the great German short story writer, Robert Walser. Um, uh, um, and also this, writing, this is, this, this is oak boards covered in porcelain into which I've, I've, I've written a text repeatedly, then more porcelain slip over it, and then rewritten it and rewritten it and rewritten it. This is palimpsest. So, 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 yeah. So, so we've talked about um, dimensionality. Yeah. So this move, this translation mm. um, from 2D to 3D, why is that of interest of you, for you now? Because it's, it, it, I, it's, I'm completely stumped by that question because it seems it, because I, it has to happen. You know, sometimes you just don't know why you're driven to explore something. Well, perhaps you are. No, no, I think I, 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 it's intuitive, isn't it? I, I, and I think about John Keats's quote about negative capability, yeah. and, and that's a space where you just have to embrace being in the unknown, yeah. but yet you move forward. You move forward. You move forward. And materiality, it's so amazing. Well, we'll come back to the palimpsest. Well, actually, this is the perfect moment to transfer to you. So people often ask, you know, uh, how do you think? How are you thinking of things? What's your flow? What's your process? So this is a, um, an imprint of an MRI, uh, an, an actual anatomical impression uh, of my brain. And some of you might remember I had this project here called Inside My Head, where I translated the anatomical into this ephemeral idea of, of thinking. And we did that through video and, and through music of, of various types. One was actually an a indexical reading of my brain, and that produced sound, and then another was Todd Reynolds improvising. So what's to be revealed? Uh, I did a series of drawings while I was in a helicopter, and I very much wanted to capture the indexical mark making of the craft and how it was moving and chattering. And um, I just kept exploring and blowing these drawings up and explored them in a dimensional way. So this is using processing, um, scanning it at high res, and then rotating it to be able to look at things in a different angle, and as well as realizing it in a 3D sculpture. The heights of these things relate to the amount of ink that's actually on the paper. So there is uh, this, this transference of the experience that I felt that I'm sharing with the viewers. And then the calligraphic marks became metal um, manifestations. And I tilted it on its side, made it in metal, where cloudy becomes a, a sculpture above us. So, so, so slow down, because this is really interesting. So uh, did you know the next stage? Or was each, you know, had you got this all planned out? Or, or, or was the process, how did the process work of moving from, from those drawings in the helicopter into, into the scanning, into this, and then above, above you in, 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 in water? Was this, was this a kind of a process that you knew that you had? Tell me more. Tell me more. Um, I thought we talked about not calling each other out. Yeah. I, I have no idea. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Cool. But okay. now, now that I'm there, okay. yeah. um, you know, it goes back to, I, I just kept blowing these up and looking at this landscape yeah. of a torn notebook mm. and appreciating the things that are so simple that we don't pay attention to and what, what can be revealed through yeah. that. But that, that seems to me completely 
true that some things just lodge with you and you, you, you know, you actually, they, they lodge with you and you cannot necessarily have an intellectual justification for why they lodged with you, but you have to keep going. Correct. Yeah. So um, knowledge, history, being in the world is so important. These are um, fragments from Ephesus. And as I was working on the project, maybe this partially answers your question, uh, working on, on the project, um, this came forth, which is the dimensionalized edge of a piece of paper. And that was realized in multiple materials. And here, uh, the Astro Gates and I um, worked on a 25 foot, six foot, wide, four foot deep sculpture that was going to go in Miami. And this, we're going to get into to place and, and the transposition of materials. So these materials were from abandoned houses in, um, in the Midwest. And we realized it in a 3D sculpture, layers and layers, back to our palimpsest. And then uh, was installed in Miami in a 3,500-square-foot site. And uh, Craig Robbins, who uh, owns the design di district, has done an extraordinary job of integrating art. Um, it's a great John Baldessari uh, behind, uh, behind the sculpture. So also by investigating the line further, uh, the, the core nature, the essence is revealed. So, so maybe again, thinking about what's deeper, what's deeper. And so this is the drawing realized on etched glass. So yeah, I mean, so uh, let's talk about dimensionality because it's it's the it's the um, it's the extraordinary thing that these very small gestures that we make, uh, these indexical gestures, these mm -hmm. extraordinary um, movements, um, can then become in the world become place. Mm -hmm. So how does a movement become a place? You know, it's such an interesting question, such a kind of vigorous question to kind of. To, 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 to live with. So in my own work, you know, having made many porcelain vessels in my life, my, my question was really about where, where in the world do they belong? Where do I want them to sit in the world? Where, where do I want them to be encountered? And it takes, took me very deeply into the experience of, of how, I, how I want to move around the world and see things. And, 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 and pause in the world, how I want, to, how I want to, to slow down in the world. So I'd, over the last sort of 15 years, I've, I've done a whole series of installations which have really investigated place in all kinds of ways. And I'm not going to go into that, all the complicated buildings and museums and interventions that I've done, because that's a whole different conversation. Um, but there have been quite a lot of them. But this image will stand as an example. It's in a, in a, in a very beautiful um, space by the sea, um, a museum designed by David Chipperfield, the great English architect who's now working, who's transforming Berlin mm -hmm. <laughs> as we speak. And this is a piece called Atmosphere, and it's hanging vitrines, suspended vitrines, which are, and all the little pots there are, are different kinds of, of cloud formations. And, and, and it was, they, they you were supposed to just look at them and lie down on a yoga mat and see light change. So that was that worked. So, so this resonates with a different point of view. What, what I try to do when I scan drawings and I'm rotating them yeah. in space. When I saw this work, I thought, we're, we're taking a different point of view. We're looking at these pots in a different way. Yeah. So, so, and 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 that can be tricky or tricksy, or, or, or but sometimes it works. Mm -hmm. So you have to try it out and you have to risk things. But but at, at, at a certain point, this is just taking that very small vessel and placing it in the world and trying and trying to discover how you might be differently in the world. And conversely, and this is something I've only just done, um, um, is to take a vessel, a small porcelain vessel, about the size of your, uh, of your coffee cup, your coffee cup there, 
in the front row. Yes, you, sir, your coffee cup. <laughs> so I make, a pot, I make a pot, I throw it in the wheel in porcelain. And this was, um, and I turn it into a space. I turn it into architecture. So what I did was to throw a pot and trim it and take all the elements from that porcelain pot. And this was for uh, an extraordinary, I have to say extraordinarily nice because it was a very long project, for, a, for, for, for an art collector who lives in Lake, Lake Como, mm -hmm. a beautiful 18th century house in Lake Como. Very nice. Um, and he wanted me to make something for this garden, Italian at gardens, the odd nymph, you know, <laughs> the odd dying gall. Uh, and so what I did was to take that porcelain vessel, take all the elements from that porcelain vessel, a tiny porcelain vessel, and make it in Carrara, make, make a pavilion a, a, por a porcelain marble pavilion in Carrara. So what it is, is this is, is, is beautiful marble, which has been honed, which has been hand carved, so that when you walk around it and you touch this marble, you're touching that, someone else's hand, you're touching my hand, you're touching this pot that I made. And you walk through this garden and you come to this pavilion, um, and all it is doing is making a space that you can sit in the world. You can pause the world, pause mm -hmm. the world. Mm -hmm. So you go in, you sit in this pavilion, and you look back at the world. And it's a bit Tyrell-like. The light changes as you go in. You have a family outside. You can sit in by yourself. And then, at night, below you is a vitrine that lights up with a 100 porcelain pots, all the pots that I made when I was thinking about this whole pavilion. So here are the pots sitting in this vitrine. And you can see, can you see these, these steel boxes with broken, broken pots? I broke up all the, all the pots that I made in the process and gilded some. You can see the gold there. And so it's a private place for this man who's very private to go with his family and sit and talk. And so you've got, you're in a vessel. Of course you're in a vessel, you're paused in a vessel, but below you is this private, secret, whole story about the journey from the hand to the body to the place. And that leads me um, to the question of um, brokenness. Why was it important that the pieces be broken inside and, and what did that communicate to you? So the world is full of broken pots. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, every single culture has used clay. And I went with one of my boys, I'm going to point to him here, up when I was writing a book, up into the Appalachian Mountains, and we found extraordinary broken, Native American broken shards in the ground. We've been up mountains in China finding broken porcelain things. The, the essence of human culture is the broken pot, the broken vessel. It's something that was complete and leaves a trace, a broken trace. So breaking things, brokenness, is, is an essential part of being human. A, a broken object, a fragment, tells you so much more than a complete, perfect object. So things come apart, and then things come together. and, and we're going to yeah. talk about yeah. that. Um, do you think it's also the artist's ethic to see the value in, in the detail, in the small, in the thing that seem mundane? Certainly. I mean, the, you know, if, if we didn't, we, we, would, you know, we would be failing a kind of, if, for me, a kind of very strong kind of ethical dimension, which is to, which is the, the, the apprehension of, of the disregarded, the overlooked, the effaced, the erased, or the broken. It's a good line, that. <laughs> um, we it, have an it's an absolute, an absolute obligation to pick those things up. I mean, I wrote a book about it, for goodness sake. That's the whole of the hair with amber eyes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the whole of that whole book, is really saying you pick something up, you have it in your hand, 
it's you know, and you try and work out what it means. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think whatever the question was, the answer is yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes and yes. Yeah. yeah. So um, w when we were doing the work of etching the fractal drawings onto etched glass, it, 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 it took a, a lot of time, uh, painfully intensive, and one arrived broken. And, and after a bit of the, the trauma of thinking about what to do with it, uh, I decided to break it further. And uh, I was entertaining the whole idea that the artist marks start with throwing ball bearings, and uh, it represented um, how, how do we situate ourselves? And the project was called Bearings Down, and it was also uh, translated into uh, video work. That's so cool. <laughs> so, so in uh, transposition in Miami, we wanted to bring attention to the whole idea of uh, brokenness and broken glass in neighborhoods. Uh, and that aligned with the whole idea of, of the reclaimed wood from these abandoned houses. And we lit this from underneath, and it was so beautiful. So um, underscoring your point mm. that the beauty can be in, in the brokenness. Mm. And, and so if I, I think about life, we live in this entropic system where things are always breaking down. Uh, we go from order to disorder. We'd like to talk a little bit about how we are trying to bring order uh, into the world in our art practices. So um, I'm involved with the largest artist pack ever called Four Freedoms. And you'll be hearing from us, I'm sure, as the 2020 election comes closer. Um, this is about translation of ideas and addressing ideas to create platforms for discussion. So this, this project is addressing the whole idea of black balls, which typically are very much about excluding, not including. This became a way to transform my art paintings into an activist sense. So we had benches in New York. We had benches uh, in Chicago that talks about, um, uh, about climate change and to create moments to pause, to actually sit, to think, uh, and have us in uh, an everyday uh, pathway. So what can I say about this? Um, 80 people have been killed or injured in the last 24 hours. Um, and hearing people talk about Sending thoughts and prayers without taking action um, is something that uh, I feel really strongly about and want to continue to make platforms for discussion. Uh, this is in Wyoming. Absolutely. Um, this is about the, the cycle um, and asking for empathy that um, People who have been hurt um, continue on the cycle of hurting uh, unless we stop and pause and um, uh, can empathize and, and hopefully connect, repair the brokenness. So action and pause are very closely allied. So there's something about finding a space in your practice, and it's something I feel very, very, you do very strongly indeed. So finding a way of, of pausing in order to make action happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to make action happen. It, it's also very sens sensorial, right? It, it's about noticing and having all of your senses a tiptoe, right? Yeah, yeah. And what's possible. Yeah, so in fact, actually, it's returning you to what it is to be a whole, a whole human being, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty strong activist position. Mm -hmm. Social change possibility and this is your practice here and it's it's very powerful and I just wanted to say a little bit about what I'm trying to do in the world in terms of of my own practice which is something that's happening at the moment in Venice during the Biennale which is where I, I've made a library and I've made 
a library of exile. So it's a small building, small pavilion that sits inside this extraordinary 16th century palace in the middle of Venice. The walls are covered with porcelain slip. And into that porcelain slip, I've written a palimpsest, which is a history of all the lost and destroyed and effaced and erased libraries of the world, from Alexandria all the way through the Madrasa libraries of the Counter-Reformation, the rabbinical libraries through the 20th century. I include my great-grandfather's library looted by the Nazis in Vienna. I, I include this extraordinary line by Heinrich Heine, where he says, where books are burned, people in the end will be burned too. I include all the book burnings. There's a whole text all the way through into the 21st century, into Sarajevo, and it goes all the way through to Mosul, the library destroyed by ISIS only five years ago. So that's the outside of this library, but it's a working library. So you go in, and there are 2,000 books written by people who've been forced into exile, refugees and migrants from, from Ovid, <laughs> 2,000 years ago through Dante, famously, to Victor Hugo, escaping all the way through the 20th century. It's full, 60 languages, uh, 100 countries, 2,000 books. Uh, and inside this are, are four installations called Psalm, because the Psalms are, are, of course, songs of exile. And these Huge installations, uh, I'm trying to find something the same size. It's as big as that, it's as big as the thing on the screen, um, are based on a, on a page of the Talmud, uh, porcelain and, and different. Uh, they're, they're really rather nice, actually. And you go in, and you can you look at these, and you can pick up books, and you can read them. And every single book has a book plate in it, which says Ex Libris, Library of Exile. And you write your name in a book that matters to you. Um, and you suggest a book that needs to be in the library. And so all the months it's been in, in, in Venice, we've had 30,000 people. We've had a, a, a writer in residence writing a children's book about refugee. We've had poets groups. We've had readers groups. We've had extraordinary writers. It was opened amazingly by Ben Okri, the great Nigerian British novelist writing about homelessness. And my final point about my library of exile is it's a migrant library. It's a traveling library. It goes from Venice, you can still see it there, until the end of September. It goes to Dresden, to, to the J Japanese palace, which was bombed in 1945. And then it comes to the British Museum in the spring, huge program events there. And then, and this is the really cool bit, um, is the whole library is being donated to Mosul. And it's going to be part of the new library, which is being rebuilt. Um, um, in Mosul. So it's, that's the journey of this library, and it's all personal stuff about <laughs> exile and, and, and what you do. And it's an artwork, mm. and it's an artwork. It's like your billboard. It's an artwork, and yet it does something. It has different kind of agency in the world. So I hand that, this back to you. Thank you. Um, so this is, uh, you know, I think about transposition. It, yeah. it is about how things are transposed, how one thing can become another how it can create a platform for conversation. And I have to say, the most uh, nourishing thing for me as an artist is to be able to create these spaces that then incite joy or creativity and moments of pause, I guess, um, dance. And the idea of these platforms, uh, the, this is a, a second project in Miami, a large solo cup. And uh, it, it's become part of the larger landscape and communicating, uh, although not my original intention, about the, the uh, minimization of the use of single-use plastics. So, and I, I've, go ahead. No, no. And I've called this project Solo Together because appreciating each individual mark, each uniqueness, um, that we have in our beings. Uh, we also work together as a community, close and far, and that solo together 
um, these are issues we need to address. Yes. Yes and yes. And so, <laughs> and so, and so, and so. I'm going to finish my bit just by talking about this project, which was there in, which happened a year ago in London in Covent Garden at the Royal Opera House. Never heard of it. Yeah, it's this small thing. <laughs> So this is the Gesamtkunstwerk. This is the total work of art. And you know, this is something we've been coming backwards and forwards to all the Bauhaus, this wonderful incendiary idea in, in the Bauhaus that, that, that actually all these different arts are, aren't just adjacent. They're, they're, they are endlessly transposing themselves, interjecting into each other, talking to each other. It's an extraordinary series of different kinds of language simultaneously talking, mm -hmm. uh, which then can occasionally become a total work of art. So I was asked, I was asked by, by the Royal Opera House to design a new work. And the new work they wanted me to respond to um, was Leonard Bernstein's Chichester Psalms, which I love. I mean, it's so wonderful. It's the Psalms sung in Hebrew. You know, it's pretty good stuff. Um, and it was going to be choreographed by Wayne McGregor, who is this uber cool choreographer, who's just you know, the coolest thing of all time. So I was thinking about vitrines. I was thinking about the vitrine as a space, which is a space of pause. Mm -hmm. It's a liminal space. It's a space, it's a threshold. Mm -hmm. It's a place of safety. It's where things can be just in the world for a bit before they move out and have this necessary difficulty of being in the world. And so what I did was to create um, a series of these vast vitrines. Um, and these are the dancers dancing Yugen, this piece which for, 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 with, you have to imagine Bernstein happening gloriously and Americanly <laughs> and in Hebrew in the background. But the solo dancers, the vitrines come and go in terms of light. Um, they disappear. There's nothing cooler than disappearing as an artist. You know, it really is it's my biggest aspiration. I'm sure it's happening all the time. And so, um, and, and, and it, do you know what? It worked, actually. You know, we, we were there at the first night, and, and it, it was extraordinary. I mean, the Royal Opera House, for goodness sake, you know. It really worked, and it worked because it was real passionate collaboration. This is the word that we've been Mid hovering around mm -hmm. all the time in that first image in your studio. Mm -hmm. Real collaboration, mm -hmm. really taking seriously the person next to you mm -hmm. and trying to listen incredibly carefully mm -hmm. to what they're saying and being really, truly careful about your own voice and then seeing what happens in between. So, so you're not on Twitter, I take it. No, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter. <laughs> I think you're thinking about Twitter. unthinking no, comments no, 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 that come no, out but, in the world. But, but, but here we are. Here we are. Red things. So, so what was the most revelatory uh, thing that came out of this for you as an artist? Um, that I want to do it again. You know, I'm, I, I sit by the phone waiting for some other incredible <laughs> opera company or dance company. But you know what? It mattered to me because for years and years and years in my studio, I had, we've still got two minutes, 17 seconds. Mm, okay. So in my studio for years and years, I had a picture of Merce Cunningham dressed in black in mid-flight, taken an image taken by Cy Twombly, or was it John Cage? Someone knows in the studio. Um, um, at Black Mountain College. And it's this wonderful calligraphic figure in mid-flight. And it, it just kept referring, meaning to me, I, I can't dance, but it, it, was the, it, was, it was a body in flight. Mm -hmm. the, 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 yeah. gestures the gestures that, that we exactly, make. the gestures. Um, instead of Merce's black, I, I love that you chose Solo Cup Red. Yes. Um, yeah. And then I would mentioned before about platforms. And all, all you need to do is, is create this space of openness and possibility. And thousands of miles away. That's um, pretty extraordinary, isn't it? Th this connectivity about the way that we are in the world. It was, it, this, this was extraordinary <laughs> when, when I saw that photograph. 
Um, so our conversation continues. The, the work continues. It's all about the work, right? And, 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 and those cookies were really nice, by yes. the way. I have to say, I have to say, Paula, you know. <laughs> they were safe. I didn't make them. Um, and, and, and then the other thing just to point to is, is place and this place of Aspen and, and how nourishing and important it is to reconnect. I know. Uh, so, so Edmund, um, I, I, truly, I hope your shows work out well in the near future so you can get yeah. Some new trousers, maybe? <laughs> so this was taken... and, and we're worried about this you, was... of course. But... <laughs> OK, at this moment, I have noticed there is a split in my trousers. Can I point out to you lovely people here, this is the definition of Aspen casual. Exactly. You know, I have uh, to say, that is, that is it. It's yeah, actually Aspen kneels. formal. <laughs> OK, 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 OK. Wonderful. Well, um, we're going to continue our yeah. conversation. We're going to do, uh, the Institute's going to do um, some recordings uh, so we can continue on and, and continue to learn. Uh, uh, and a final question, because we've, yes. we've run out of time. Yes. So this is the final question. Bring us back to the Bauhaus. If, if you were in, in the Bauhaus, which studio, which studio would you gravitate to? Because I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. If you were there with, in your multi- Hyphenate practice. I love that phrase. Your multi. Which studio would you end up in? I would do theater and work with Oscar Schlemmer because that is not my normal way of being in the world, and I'd like to learn and expand that. Cool. How about you? And you can't be in the pottery studio I, I, or ceramics. I, I wouldn't want to be. They were a really bad tempered lot. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, 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 famously so, just causing problems. No, I, 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 I would go into textiles, like a shot. I, I absolutely like a shot. I'd be there and text and textile. I'd be there and I would try and make friends with Annie Albers. And I would, I, you know, I would, I, that's, my God, that's where I'd be. TBC, TBC. to be continued. TBC. And thank, thank you all. You.